Welcome to episode 24 of The Brainy Business, Understanding the Psychology of Why People Buy. This Behavioral Economics Foundations episode is all about the sense of sight. Ready? Let's get started. You are listening to the Brainy Business Podcast, where we dig into the psychology of why people buy and help you incorporate behavioral economics into your business, making it more brain friendly. Now here's your host, Melina Palmer. Hello, everyone. My name is Melina Palmer, and I want to welcome you to the Brainy Business Podcast. Today, we are beginning a series on the five senses, beginning with sight and moving through sound, touch, taste, and smell, but not necessarily in that order. I'm starting with sight because it is the most powerful of our senses by far, and the things I'm going to share with you in this episode are really just going to blow your mind. (laughs) Do keep in mind that because this is about seeing things and podcasts are a sound only medium, that there will be some complimentary blog posts. And if you have never checked out the show notes, this would be a great one to start with because the videos and articles I've linked to have so many awesome things you will have to see to believe. But before we get to all that, it is time for shout outs. First of all, Instagram has been very popular since the last recording. Both BizChicks podcast and Brit Joyner, who I have mentioned on the show before, gave shout outs about episode 23 on reciprocity. Britt commented on the post saying, amazing episode. This is one of my faves. And Natalie Ekdahl of the Biz Chicks podcast gave a shout out on her Insta stories saying, great episode, The Brainy Biz, which is awesome. So thank you both so much. It means so much to me that you listen and interact with the podcast. And I really appreciate you both. And in case you have not yet listened to last week's episode on reciprocity, it was clearly very well received. You can add it to the queue or simply subscribe to the podcast so you get them all and never miss an episode and give it a listen after this one. It was a lot of fun and all about the power of giving gifts in your business. And speaking of gifts, in that episode, I announced my end of year sale, which I'm going to go ahead and remind you about now. Most people work with me via virtual strategy sessions. This is a one hour call via Zoom where we really dig into your business. You can either come with an existing problem you want to solve or uh, without a fire to put out. (laughs) Those are some of my favorite ones. During the call, I ask a lot of questions questions and help to uncover the best ways to make your business more brain friendly and answer your questions using behavioral economics concepts like the ones I talk about on the podcast. And as I said, they can be used for one-off questions, but they're so valuable when we get to work together long-term, say with a monthly call. Like any long-term coaching or consulting, as we get to know each other better, I know more of your goals and we're continually refining the message and brand story and pricing to all be in alignment, cohesive. It's really magical. And the value of each strategy session just goes up and up and up because we're piling on top of what we've already done. One of my clients, Kelsey Rees of The Knotted Wood, so you know who to thank, asked about a discount for Black Friday for a long-term commitment, and it was perfect timing with that reciprocity episode and everything, so I said yes, and you can all benefit from it. If you sign up before the end of the year for six months of strategy sessions, and knowing you don't have to separate them out one per month or anything, but six in 2019, you'll get them all for 10% off, which is a saving of almost $300. And if you sign up for 12 sessions, it's 20% off of each, which is also known as $1,200 in savings. Save $1,200. That is my big gift to you this holiday season, as announced in last week's episode on reciprocity. If you're interested, send me an email 
melina at thegrainybusiness.com. And even if you just felt that little twang of interest of thinking, maybe, or wouldn't that be nice? (laughs) Send me an email and let's talk about your options. There's no obligation, no obligation to sign up. And we can just see if you're a fit. I promise to only work with people who I know will get way more value than the price of a session. They really pay for themselves. And again, that email is melina at thegrainybusiness.com. Okay. Moving on to the next shout out, estate planning mom also did a shout out on her Insta stories and said, started a new podcast this morning. Great information. Yay. (laughs) Glad to have you in the family. I met Krista of estate planning mom at biz chicks live a couple of weeks ago, and we got to spend quite a bit of time chatting and getting to know each other. In case you couldn't tell by the name, she does estate planning. (laughs) She is an attorney who specializes in helping parents with young children to get all their legal stuff in order, including wills and trusts and things like that, to make sure their kids are taken care of if things ever go wrong. This is a state of time discounting, something she's going to have to uh, be getting over of people not wanting to do things that are difficult to talk about. It's an interesting conundrum similar to getting people people to save more, to exercise. And I love the um, you know behavioral economics of projects like that. So she's awesome and is doing amazing work. Thanks for listening and for the shout out. There is a link to her Instagram in the show notes, as well as for Kelsey of The Knotted Wood, Biz Chicks, and for Britt Joyner are all linked in the show notes. Lastly, a quick revisit from an older shout out in episode 21 on habits. I mentioned a five star review that came through from the UK. It was my first international shout out, which was very exciting. But because of the system I was able to see it in, I didn't know the name. And so I asked whoever it was (laughs) into the abyss of the podcast episode to reach out and let me know when they heard it. And He did. His name is Hazem, and he sent a message through the Facebook page to let me know that the review is actually not from the UK, but from Libya, which is super cool. He has recently completed a master's in business psychology from Harriet Watt University in Scotland, which could be why the review came in as the UK. I don't know. And he let me know he has shared information about the podcast, the Brainy Business YouTube channel, and just the Brainy Business in general with his colleagues, which is really awesome and exciting. And to show the diversity of listeners to you, not just by location, he is a project manager in the oil and gas industry and does work in leadership development. So... He said he's really enjoyed applying the lessons on habits and change management in his career uh, in Libya, which is so cool. So thanks again for listening, reviewing and reaching out, Hazem. I'm happy to have you in the Brainy Business family, and I really appreciate you. If you want to interact with Hazem and learn more about him, come chat with us on the Facebook page where you can find me as the Brainy Biz. That's B-I-Z. And really, that's how you find me anywhere, Instagram, Twitter, what have you. But come on over to Facebook, like the page. Again, it's completely free and you can ask me questions. I love chatting and interacting with listeners. And this is a great time because I'm going to share some posts and videos with those images of these optical illusions and stuff about the sense of sight that I talked about earlier that you will be able to check out there. So again, if you come to Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, find me as the brainy biz b-i-z so we can chat and interact and you can get even more content than what you're able to just hear on the podcast you can see things there on social media all right thanks again to each of you who i gave shout outs to in this episode as well as everyone else who has subscribed 
rated and left a review on the podcast. It helps people from around the world, as we can see, to find the podcast because it comes up differently in the ratings. And your reviews help people to know that it's something they should be listening to or if it ties into what they're looking for or not. It's just really helpful. And when you share on social media, you know, it's the same thing. It gets people to understand that the podcast even exists. So to each of you who have done so already. I really appreciate it and want to thank you all. If you, listener, have not yet subscribed, rated, or left a review, it is super easy to do. And as I've said, I very much appreciate you taking the time to do that if you would be willing to do so. To subscribe means that you never miss an episode. They download automatically on your device, which is awesome, and you get them right when they come out. You can just tap the subscribe button in whatever app you're listening on, and right there you can see the stars. If they're not yet filled in, I would appreciate you considering giving them a tap. Hopefully, five stars is something you feel is appropriate. And you can also click to leave a review. If you do leave a review, keep a listen out on a future episode where you will probably hear me give you a shout out and a link in the show notes, just like I did for these wonderful listeners today. It's just my way of saying thank you and showing how much you mean to me. And speaking of those show notes, I've mentioned them a couple times, and I want to make sure you know what they are and where to find them. I'm not going to mention them much throughout the episode, but know that anytime you think, oh, that sounds amazing, let me make a note of that so I can go check it out later. You should visit the show notes first because I have anticipated that and I've put all the links there so you don't have to try to remember and search and everything. That's just too much for your brain to keep track of. So you can find the show notes within the podcast app you are listening to or by visiting thebrainybusiness.com slash 24 because this is episode 24. In addition to the links to those who got shout outs in the episode, there are also links to reference relevant studies in case you want to dig into them and any past episodes that are mentioned that I think are really complimentary to this one. That way they're super easy. You don't have to remember, you know, what was the number for priming again? It's linked. You can find it really easy there. And because this is a foundational episode, there is a free worksheet available for you to download on that same page of the website, thebrainybusiness.com slash 24. You can just click on the image at the top of the page and download it now and follow along as you listen if you want, or you can grab it later if you're out and about. I know a lot of listeners have told me they listen while running or at the gym or driving. I know that's when I listen to podcasts. So if you want to download it after the fact to help reinforce the concepts, uh, it's all going to be really helpful for you. And that's why we're here to make sure you can have this be impactful on your business. So if you're already subscribed and you get the Brainy Business email from me every week on Fridays, there is a direct link to that freebie in that email, uh, the same one that had this episode in it. And all the emails now have this special secret freebies page that's for subscribers only, where you can access at any time all the freebies without having to sign up again. And again, that link is in all the emails you get once you have subscribed. So if you get those emails, you can go there and download everything, including my free ebook, the 10 behavioral economics concepts you need to know and how to apply them. If you're not yet on the list and you would like to be, simply sign up for any of the freebies and you will automatically be added. Again, the freebie for this episode is at thebrainybusiness.com slash 24. And if you're in the States and you want to sign up from your phone, you can just text the word brainy, B-R-A-I-N-Y, to 345345. That'll put you on the list. And to say thank you, I will send you a copy of my ebook, The 10 Behavioral Economics Concepts You Need to Know and How to Apply Them. I have mentioned some of those 10 concepts on the show already, but some of them haven't been covered yet. So there is new information there for sure you will want to check out and be able to dig into. Okay, that's it for shout outs and housekeeping items. 
Let's go ahead and jump in and talk about the first of the five senses and how it impacts your business. The sense of sight. You are familiar with the senses, of course. Maybe you first learned about them when you were in kindergarten, (laughs) definitely from a young age. And you might think you know all you need to about your senses, but there's oh so much more to know. And it absolutely impacts your business. As I said at the top of the show, I'm starting with sight because it is the most impactful. About a quarter of your brain is involved in visual processing. And when I say vision is the most impactful of the senses, let me break that down for you a little more. Of your body's sense receptors, what percentage do you think are in your eyes? You might guess that because there are five senses, each would get 20%. And then, because I said your sense of sight was the most impactful, maybe you give it a little more and get to a third, 33%. Anchoring and adjustment in action right there. But you would still be too low by a lot. In reality, about 70% of the body's sense receptors are in our eyes. Whoa, (laughs) that means the other four senses are fighting over the remaining 30%. Best case scenario, they would each get 7.5%, which is one-tenth almost of what the sense of sight gets. You know how I always say your subconscious is very visual? Well, now you know why. And those 11 million bits of information per second that it's processing, a lot of that is coming through your eyes. This impacts your business in all sorts of ways. But before I get to that, I'm going to tell you some more about how the eyes work and how that relates to the brain. First, I have a question to ask you. Is vision in your eyes or in your brain? While we tend to use the two words interchangeably, in reality, sight and vision are two different things. The sense of sight takes place in the eyes. It's all the little bits of information coming into them. But vision Vision does not actually happen in your eyes. Vision is in your brain and is much, much more complex than sight. As I will show and explain to you in the coming examples and explanations, vision is actually built on expectations in the brain based on past experience, just like everything else your brain does. (laughs) I'm going to reference a lot of fascinating articles and TED Talks throughout the episode, which are all linked in the show notes. And as I said earlier, because we're talking about the power of seeing things, it kind of helps if you can see what I'm talking about. So if you have not checked into the show notes before, you definitely should uh, for this episode. You can either go now or afterwards. Simply visit thebrainybusiness.com slash 24 and access the links. Or if you're listening to this in a podcast app, they're there as well. And you can just give them a tap and check them out. And on social media, I'll be linking to blogs and posts and things about them. So a little more about the difference between sight and vision. The sense of sight is bringing in a lot of stimuli that it can't actually interact with, light, color, contrast, in a big flood of information all the time. I kind of have been, as I've been working on this episode, I've been thinking about in the matrix when he looks at the screen and sees ones and zeros. And the other guy says, oh, really? All I see, you know, I said, redhead, blonde, brunette. He's able to look past the ones and zeros to see the information behind. It's kind of like that <laughs> little nerd moment for you there, I guess. <laughs> the process of interpreting that information is a task for the brain. This is where the data points are sifted through to choose what is important, categorize by what is expected, and project the information back to make decisions quickly. 
You know those tests where you're shown a sentence with letters removed and you can still read what it says? That is a trick of the concept of vision. Your brain is projecting what letters should appear in the space based on past experience and allows you to read the word without actually needing all the letters to be there. You're able to get the gist without needing all the information. And it's often right, but sometimes it guesses and uses that information wrong, as with all the rules of thumb your brain uses. Again, vision is taking place in the brain and not in the eyes. So it's not a perfect representation of the world around you. So as I'll talk about later in the episode in business applications, when you feel you have to really explain everything that you can, all the information about your product and really making those connections, tying things together, the brain is going to fill in the gaps a lot of the time. And so knowing that it might not need to be exactly step by step by step because it's going to make these summaries for you. Again, the eyes are still essential for vision, but they're bringing in lots of raw data that don't mean anything until they're processed. Think about a spreadsheet with thousands of individual data points. They don't mean anything until you process the information. This is like sight and vision. So what are the pieces of information made up of? Our eyes do a lot of amazing things, and I am not an expert in eye anatomy here. I am simply explaining the relevant concepts and applications to help you understand how the brain processes stimuli from the eyes. I've linked to a bunch of articles with more detail on all the parts of the eye, but the first thing that matters for us here is the retina. Inside the retina are photoreceptors. Perhaps you've heard of rods and cones in your eye. They are shaped differently, hence their different names, because they do different things. Rods are sensitive to dark versus light, and cones are sensitive to color. While I'm not going to get into color theory here, that is going to be the topic of its own episode later, and it will be soon because you have been asking for it. I do want to talk a little about color projection and how optical illusions work. Have you ever seen those images where one side, if you were to split like a piece of paper in half, one side is black with what looks like a white square in the middle and the other side is white with what looks like a black or very dark square in the middle. And then you see that when the backgrounds are removed, they're actually the same shade of gray or the infamous dress, which basically broke the Internet a few years ago when half the world insisted it was white and gold and the other half insisted it was blue and black. These are color illusions where the items surrounding the object in question trick the eye and the brain (laughs) into seeing a different color. When it looks like something is in shadow, like there's a table there, our brain makes it look darker, for example, even when it's the exact same color as something right next to it. And it is a drawing. So there actually isn't a shadow. You know, it's your brain projecting what it expects to see based on what it has experienced in the past. I've linked to a really awesome TED Talk called Optical Illusions Show How We See where Bo Lotto does an amazing job of explaining how this works within the brain and what's happening. And he has a ton of examples to show them all. It's really fascinating. And it's about 15 minutes in the actual content of it. One of the best quotes I think in that video is when he says, the brain did not evolve to see the world in the way that it was. The brain evolved to see the world in the way that was useful to see in the past. This is why illusions can trick the eye because it's constantly interpreting data and then projecting that vision for us to be able to be kind of one step ahead based on what it's known previously. Okay, so next let's talk about Focus. If you think about taking a picture with a camera, 
or any of the images in portrait mode where the main figure is crisp and clear and everything around it is fuzzy or blurred. And that just looks so beautiful and amazing. You're really able to focus. It's because that's how our eyes interpret information all the time. The highest resolution is near the middle. That's what you're focusing on. And detail goes down as we see further distances on the periphery, which is your peripheral vision. I want you to think back to the example I gave about missing letters and your brain still being able to get the full word. Have you ever experienced a picture or a painting from a distance and been able to tell exactly what it was? And when you got up close, it was a bunch of dots with big spaces in between, like on the side of a bus, for example, with uh, advertisements. Our brains fill in that missing information using vision, but the predictions still count on the information coming through the eyes. So you need that stimuli to come in for it to be able to make a prediction. And let me give you an example. I love, 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 love impressionistic paintings. They're my absolute favorite. And I've had the honor of being able to visit Monet's home when my husband and I went to France last year. And I've seen countless water lily paintings in person. I love them all. And Blue Dancers by Degas. Don't even get me started. I could talk about these paintings all day. But did you know that the style of these paintings, the ones I love so much, so many of us love so much, are actually in many ways because of diseases in the eye? Monet's early work was full of blues and purples, which are almost completely absent from later work. And the brush strokes got progressively thicker and more blurry as time went on. The colors got muddier, kind of brown. And this is because he had cataracts and actually had multiple surgeries on his eyes to try and correct it. But he lost the ability to see those colors or with as much crispness as he had earlier even though he was painting the same pond on a property where he had lived for over four decades without the ability to see clearly and in full color, his vision could only piece together so much as he was turning it into a painting. He kept his paints actually in a specific order on the palette and would number them. So he knew what he was painting with, even if he could not see the colors properly when he was trying to go off of memory, but he lived on this property. He loves painting this space. So he wanted to be out and to see the, the bridge and the water and everything. And you can see how that transitions over time. His cataracts developed when he was in his 70s. And uh, so he has many, many, there are many years of amazing paintings that are much more crisp. And much to the chagrin of lovers of his art, he actually threw away many of the paintings he created in those last 10 years of his life because he felt that they weren't representative enough of the really true beauty around him. So what about Degas? He actually developed retinal disease at the age of 36 and could not be in intense light, which is why he began painting inside the ballet and opera houses. And he also started to have blurred vision. So his work, which was once so crisp, began to have blurred lines and less details in the faces and textures and things over time. Even though the images are blurry, we still know what we're looking at when we see these paintings. When you see a Monet or a Degas, your brain can tell whether you're looking at a pond or a ballerina, which is truly amazing when you think it's just a bunch of random blotches of paint and the brain can piece together what it's supposedly looking at based on prior experiences and being able to pick out things around you and interpret that into a concept of a person wearing a tutu or a lily on a pond. Just think if they had stopped painting or drawing when they had received their diagnoses, how different our world would be today? Hmm, it's fascinating. <laughs> our brains are actually conditioned to see and pick out faces, which is why we sometimes see them in strange places like grilled cheese sandwiches or cloud formations. 
This can either be to see predators or to understand allies. That's why we've evolved to have this skill. The information coming in through our senses allows us to know immediately if the thing in front of us looks menacing and we should run or friendly, so we should approach. And this is partially because our eyes are on the front of our head instead of the side like a deer. Being able to focus forward in this way with both eyes pointing in the same direction, but slightly in separate spots is what creates our depth perception. And this is why optical illusions work for a drawing on a flat sheet of paper or chalk on the ground. And it can look like it's three dimensional. If you've ever seen where people can put like stickers on the floor and it looks like you're going to fall into a uh, pond or something along those lines, or there have been really cool pieces of artwork where when you look at them at just the right angle, they look perfect. And every other angle, they look really weird and stretched out. (laughs) It's because the brain is actually interpreting the stimuli coming through the eyes. And it doesn't matter that it's actually flat. It creates this vision of what we see based on the past rules of thumb and what it expects the information is supposed to look like, regardless of what's actually coming in through the eyes. Think about 3D glasses. Have you ever stopped to wonder why that actually works? (laughs) I mean, from the original version of one red filter and one blue filter, Why does that make things look like they're coming out of the screen or that there's depth back beyond the flat wall? This is because of binocular disparity, which is just those two eyes in different spots that see slightly different things, but are both pointing in the same direction, the way our eyes are set up. The easiest way to see this in action is to look at something in front of you. It can be anything. So right now, Pick something like I'm at my desk. I'm going to look at my water bottle that's sitting here. Or you could look at your phone in your hand. And if you look at it and close your left eye, but keep your right eye open. And then without moving your head or the object you're focusing your attention on, you want to simultaneously close your right eye while you open the left and then switch back and forth. Do you see how the object appears to move from left to right, even though you know (laughs) that it and you are not moving? That is binocular disparity. When you look at things with both eyes, the data coming in combines in the brain to explain what we're looking at. So you have stimuli coming into your right eye, stimuli coming into your left eye through this sense of sight. It gets combined in your brain to then make this singular picture of what's in front of you. And that is what creates depth. So why is there color on those original versions of 3D glasses? What does that have to do with anything? The way they have this set up is that when a movie is shot in 3D in this traditional format, it has two slightly offset images that were filmed separately, but at the same time, one is red and the other is a bluish or cyan. And when they're laid on top of each other, and you're wearing the glasses, the filter that screen the lens that you have on there with one eye only taking in the red images, the other takes in the blue because of those lenses, your eye is able to react to its environment very quickly. And so if it's only taking in blue, the other side's only taking in red, it's then creating this piece of depth that makes it appear three-dimensional when those two images combine in the brain. If you take the glasses off, it might give you a headache to watch the screen. And it just looks really weird and kind of blurry and strange colors. But you can see the distinct blue and red images if you look closely enough. With the glasses on, they completely fade away, which is really amazing if you think about it. There is in the new glasses uh, that don't have red and blue, if you're curious how that works, uh, they use polarization. I've linked to a video in the show notes that tells about more detail on what I just told you about the original 3D glasses and then the new polarization and how that works. And you can actually sort of see it in the video, which is pretty cool. 
So this shows you how your two eyes are actually bringing in, like I said, separate pieces of data and the information only makes sense when it's combined in the brain, which kind of makes you ask the question, what's 3D and 2D in the real world? If something that's flat can look three dimensional, if something that's three dimensional could look flat if you close your eye, you know, it's all about depth perception. And this is the same reason why with the way that our eyes can adjust so quickly that if you need bifocals, you can have laser eye surgery in one eye to correct for distance, but have the other to help you see close up. And it takes a couple of weeks for the brain to get used to seeing this way, but eventually it can interpret the information around you and know to only use the information from the far away eye when looking at distances and the other eye for close up. It's going to rewrite this new rule. And it's just amazing when you think about it. If you've been seeing with two eyes for, let's say, 50 years and you change absolutely everything your brain knows that it can rely on what these rules are about both eyes and it can learn this completely new approach of just relying on one eye in this situation and these are the times to rely on this other eye in just a couple of weeks, it's really just very cool and amazing. One reason this works is because your brain is constantly scanning and interpreting information. And a lot of that, like I've said, is coming in from your eyes. You don't realize it, but your eyes scan the world around you on average three times every second. That means when you think you're just looking at your computer screen or looking forward on the road while you're driving or walking, your eyes are actually moving all the time and checking the environment for threats or interesting tidbits. (laughs) If nothing of note is going on, it doesn't alert your conscious brain because it doesn't need to know. But the information it is taking in is impacting your behavior, whether you realize it or not. This is why priming, which was the focus of episode 18, impacts behavior and people don't realize it or would say that it had nothing to do with any of their actions. And it's why people will say they never pay attention to ads in Facebook feed or watch commercials, but they're absolutely having an impact on them, as studies have shown. Your brain is taking all that in and evaluating it, even if it doesn't hit your consciousness. But when the brain wants a distraction or something really cool or enticing pops up, then you notice it, right? (laughs) Ever wonder why that one thing caught your attention? How fortunate you are that that came up at the exact right moment when you needed it. It's because nothing else mattered enough to flag the conscious brain. You saw everything else. It just wasn't important enough to your, in your subconscious's opinion <laughs> to make a flag. It's why when you buy a green car and you start to see them everywhere and why the truth about pricing is that it's not about the cookie and the order things are presented in matters. But we'll get into that more on the episode about scent. So. You might ask, if our eyes are constantly scanning the world around us, why do we not see big blurry blobs all the time? It's because vision is in our brain. Of course, we have evolved so that we can focus on something and constantly scan our environment for threats or potential stimuli through saccades. (laughs) (laughs) saccades in our uh, brain is that they are why things like flip books work. Our brain weaves together a stream of basically still images and connects the missing pieces to create a steady flow of movement. It predicts what is missing to make it look and feel as if it is constant. It's pretty cool, right? And this is what it's doing all day, all the time, which is why it can adapt pretty quickly on a flipbook. If you notice, you know, the first couple of images look like they're broken up, but then it starts to move. It's because it's learning from what it's seeing in, in the environment around it. And when you're focused on things like reading a book, the eyes do move around less, only 10 to 20% of the time. So you can have some attention, but still be aware of the world around you. 
If you're scanning objects in the distance, your eyes will probably move around more because there's a lot to look at and take in and evaluate. When I was a kid, I did a lot of acting and spent many summers growing up as actually an extra on the set of movies that were filmed in the Seattle area. My dad traveled a lot, which is sort of a necessity for an airline pilot. (laughs) And so my mom had jobs with flexible schedules. So she could often take us with her on those jobs. And one of them was at a casting company, which meant we could all be on set together. Anyway, I learned something about this when I was on the set for Prefontaine, and I didn't really understand the science behind it at the time, but it's something I never forgot. So that movie is about uh, the first star runner signed to Nike back in the 1970s when he was at the University of Oregon. And needless to say, there were a lot of people running around the track (laughs) and they were filming the actor's watching people run or they're supposed to be when filming often there's going to be a close up of someone's face the actor and they're having a reaction to something that might be as far as we perceive when we're watching a movie it's like they're talking to someone that's right in front of them or they're watching something in the distance but they are actually acting like it's there and when it's being filmed you know the person they're talking to might not actually be standing in front of them but When someone is supposed to be watching someone, let's say, walk, if there's nothing for them to actually watch that's going to be moving along that same path in the distance, the camera will actually pick up their eyes darting all over the place and they don't move in a smooth line. And this is a biological thing. You can't act your way through it. You can't control your eyes to not do that without something to focus on. So when the actor on camera is supposed to be watching something go from one side of the shot to another, they need to actually watch someone or something go from one side to the other. This gets the extra focus of attention that is needed so that the eyes don't look weird and shifty. And so if you realize once you can capture someone's attention with your marketing, your advertising, whatever it is, for even just a second, that extra focus is so much more streaming information coming into the brain that's going to be able to be reacted on and processed Even if they're not thinking they're taking a lot of conscious action, the brain focusing for just a split second can actually create a lot of benefit for you and your brand if you can do something that's interesting and different. So with so much going on around us, our brains need to deploy selective attention to only flag the conscious brain of what matters, which I've talked about before. This is what keeps us from basically... (laughs) being stuck in the fetal position all the time because we can't handle all the stimuli around us. Often our brains miss huge and glaring, crazy things when we're told to focus on something else. I'm going to talk about an experiment here. And if you want to experience this next thing before I explain it to you, I want to give you a chance to do so. So if you're at a point where you want to stop and watch a video, this is a good time. I've embedded a video in the show notes page of the website, thebrainybusiness.com slash 24. It's about 90 seconds long. If you want to hit pause and go watch that really quick before I explain what happens, but it's been around for 20 years or something. So it's not like it's completely brand new thing. So I will be here when you get back. It's about selective attention. Okay. Welcome back for those of you who left. And for those of you who didn't uh, go watch the video, let me tell you what happens. It starts a video with six people in it. Three are wearing white t-shirts and three are wearing black t-shirts. Presumably they're on teams because one person in a black shirt and one person in a white shirt has a basketball. And the instruction the video gives you is to count how many times the people wearing white shirts pass the ball to each other. And you probably think, this is easy. I can count passes of people in white shirts. What a dumb task. But you want to prove you can do it correctly because that's how our brains work. You want that dopamine of, will I be able to get this? And so you start counting. And you might even lean in a little toward the screen to make sure you really get it. You're super focused on the video. One, two, three. 
And then it stops and goes to a black screen and asks, how many passes did you count? And then you would say your answer. And then it comes up and says, the correct answer is 15 passes. And then it asks, but did you see the gorilla? It then rewinds and shows you that a person in a gorilla costume walked into the shot from the right side a few seconds in, went into the middle of the circle, pounded its chest a few times, and then walked to the left off screen. When you know it's there and you aren't focusing on counting the passes to people in white shirts, it's super obvious. And everyone would say that they would see it. But the tests showed before it became really famous and people knew what to expect that actually about half, half of the people did not see the gorilla walk into the middle, pound its chest and walk away because it was wearing black shirts and people were told to focus on white. It's crazy. (laughs) And they have a ton of other fun videos on this topic on their website and in the book, The Invisible Gorilla, which I have linked to in the show notes. If you've ever been to a networking event or conference and you walked up to a registration table and you talked to someone for a minute and then they pointed to something in the other direction, say, look, the entrance to the event is over there. And in the split second while you turned away, that person ducked under the table and a completely different person was to pop up and finish the conversation. Would you notice? You might think you would, but due to selective attention and inattentional blindness, a lot of people don't. Even if the new person has different colored hair or is wearing a different colored shirt, they are focused on the task at hand, the person that's having the conversation, and everything else is just part of the periphery, this sort of blurry space and less important. And it's not being fully interpreted by vision, even though it's coming in through your sense of sight. Which is why if you're walking down the street and maybe a taxi cab is in focus because it's coming toward you and then you're focused on a bicycle or whatever it is and everything else, you don't really realize that your eye is blurring your vision around you of everything else. But some of the videos I've tagged here in the show notes show how you can witness the way that your eyes do this. It's really fascinating. So this all leads me to ask you, what is reality? Do we all live in the same reality or is my reality different from yours? If I say A and you say Z, can we both be right? To answer these questions, we're going to start with another experiment. I want you to imagine we're in a room together. We're in a tall building and there's a big window facing the ocean. It's a beautiful, clear day and we have unobstructed views. We're both going to look out the window for 30 seconds and then describe what we saw. Maybe I would turn to you and say, it's windy out right now because I watched this beautiful sailboat move along at a pretty good pace. And you'd say, what? I didn't see a sailboat, but I saw some trees and I didn't notice them moving around. I don't think there's wind. And then I might say, trees? What kind were they? Maybe they're the kind that don't blow in the wind. The sailboat was definitely moving. And you'd say, I'm not a tree expert, but I saw a tanker on the water and it wasn't moving much and there weren't waves. And maybe you don't even believe now that there was a sailboat. You would have seen it, right? I mean, maybe I'm making it up to trick you and make you feel dumb. And now we're at an impasse because we can't be saying different things and both be right, right? (laughs) Miscommunications come up often because we're unwilling to believe that our way is not the only way and that multiple people and perspectives can still be right, that we can see an entire scene and you think you have this perfectly amazing photo memory of what's around you. But in reality, we don't because of this difference between sight and vision and the things that my subconscious will flag and feel are important and log into memory are not the same. If you're even at just a slightly different angle, it can make a real difference. This is the way that I can see something and it's not the same as you. And that's okay. We can both look at the same scene and see two completely different things. We actually probably both saw everything, but our subconscious brains cared about different things in the moment and focused attention differently based on our experiences and the meaning that comes with that. So what about that meaning we assign to the things that we see? Our brains can often attach meaning to all sorts of things when they aren't there. Think about a time a significant other said, we need to talk. 
and you spent hours or days agonizing over what that means before you had the real conversation. That's all in your head, but really so is everything else. (laughs) So here's an example of this in action using visual imagery. When you think about someone going to be evaluated by a psychiatrist, if I was to say, what do you think they're going to do? What tests? One suggestion you might come up with is an ink blot test where you're shown a sheet of paper with a bunch of blotches on it and you're supposed to explain what you see. I might look at an image and see a bear and you look at the exact same image and you see a dog or a person or a butterfly or a train. This happens because of how our brains process information. And the test is not about the image. Spoiler alert, it truly isn't a picture of anything. It's about the explanation and what associations your mind makes. These associations are simply triggered by a strange image your mind is trying to make sense of and the process of explaining your thoughts as you look at it. This is another example of how two people can look at the exact same thing and interpret it in two completely different ways. And this is why a picture is worth at least a thousand words. I would say that is an understatement, to be honest. Our visually fueled subconscious is scanning and taking in all sorts of stimuli for the brain to interpret, including the emotions and other contexts that might come into play. I've given the example of a red rose in past episodes. If I was to show you a picture of a red rose, the brain has all sorts of ties to that, including the emotional attachment of red roses, anniversaries, Valentine's Day, grandma's perfume or mom's rose garden. And it's almost as if they're actually there in front of you. Our brain mostly thinks in images and emotions and processes them constantly and basically instantaneously. And that visual stimuli is really the same for the brain, whether it's a picture or a physical rose in front of you. And this is why Pinterest and Instagram are so popular. You can scan through countless images and take in what's there without really taking in anything at all, because this is what your brain does all day anyway. And if photos are worth a thousand words, video is worth more. It stops you and makes your brain say, ooh, even for just a second. When it comes to your brand and business, it is worth investing in great images. Do not use clip art or stretch out images to fit a size so that your logo or a person's face is stretched out. The brain will pick up on the discrepancy immediately, and it assumes that you're an amateur. Whether they articulate it or not, whether they know it or not, it happens. And our eyes are trained to look at other eyes and follow their gaze. Check out some of my social media content. You can find me, like I've said, on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter as The Brainy Biz. Or you can go to my website, thebrainybusiness.com, check out YouTube. I have professional images that were taken by the great Jennifer Findlay of me with brain or alone. And if you notice, I'm often looking or pointing up at words that I want you to read. And the other images that jump out at you where you actually read or digest words, if you were just to scan through Instagram or Pinterest and see what are the things that make you want to stop, they probably have this too, this pointing or something that is drawing your attention to what you're supposed to look at. And it's because our brains want to look where others are looking or pointing. Revisit episode 19 on herding to learn more about this. Okay, I'm pretty sure I've said this about a million times and I will say it a million more and you've heard it a million times from me and other people, but it's still logically hard to accept this. So please listen to me when I say this next thing. It's very important. You can say more with a lot less if you have a strong and strategic image with a lot less words. Again, you can say more with a lot less with a strong image and a lot less words, especially if there's strategy behind that image. Our brains are used to interpreting and thinking about visual stimuli and too many words make it shut down and ignore the whole thing. Then it gets bored or stressed and wants to play Candy Crush or check out Instagram for a minute. Check out episodes 21 and 22 on habits to learn more about this. 
I know many of you have listened to episode two, the top five wording mistakes businesses make because it's the second most downloaded episode on the podcast. In it, I have categorized the different mistakes, one of which is too much. Basically, everything has too much copy. (laughs) Let's say I want to run a Facebook ad. What's the point of it? Sure, I want people to know about my podcast and like the Facebook page and follow me on Instagram and Twitter and subscribe to the YouTube channel and get on my email list and book a discovery call so we can talk about a virtual strategy session and I can have them convert to a playing client. But I can't ask for all of that in one advertisement because it's overwhelming and crazy (laughs) And to try to say all of that to people and they will simply say, nope, and not take in any of it. There's far too much going on. It's way too easy to ignore what's out there and not take in anything when it's words. Instead, I need to decide the one thing they should do and then put everything just pushing toward that same effort. So let's say I want this ad to be for my online course of launching a brain friendly podcast. How am I going to get them with the visuals? And can I add a little movement, maybe using a GIF or the boomerang app to catch attention? Does the image show someone celebrating and throwing money in the air because they're converting so much? Or maybe an image of downloads with a constant uptick showing how many subscribers they're getting or a bunch of people raising their hands and looking happy. The right image can do wonders and the wrong image can kill an advertisement. And I might just need uh, a couple words to say, get a this course or want a podcast that converts, you know, and then you get the image and you want it like click here, want a podcast that converts, click here. And it's got the image that their brain understands and pieces together all this other information of what I'm trying to say, what they're going to get, the emotions, the feelings, the imagery, it builds this whole picture when it has a really good image and just a slight little tweak of information of what they're trying to do. If two ads say exactly the same thing, but have different layouts or images, they will perform differently. And this is why you need strategy and testing to understand how the brain is going to interpret the stimuli you put in front of it to create a vision of what you're trying to communicate. At the end of the day, our lives are a string of memories, including the way we interact with brands. Brands are just memories, and because the memory is heavily composed of visuals and emotions, the visuals you choose to use in your business and branding will impact how people think of you, your business, and your brand, and whether they take action or not. This is also why we need things like speaker reels. I can say I'm flown in to speak at all sorts of conferences to diverse audiences, and I can show quotes from members of the audience what they've said, or I can say people rate me really high, but having a simple image of five filled stars says a lot more than I could in words. And a video of me actually on a stage helps someone to see my personality and experience it in a way that words just don't convey. And if you think that visuals aren't important, Consider this, 85% of videos are watched without sound on Facebook and other social media channels, I'm sure. I don't know if I have ever intentionally turned on the sound while watching videos on Instagram. It's kind of more annoying when they just pop up and have sound on them. And if I can't get the point without sound, next, scroll away. So what does your video look like with the sound off? Subtitles can help but not every video gets that. And is your video interesting enough to make someone want to click on it or turn on the sound? Do you look compelling without the sound or is it confusing and weird and the brain is going to step away? What's going on in the background? Can people see the messy desk or a crooked painting or something else distracting? Because the brain will focus on that instead of you. You need to take a step away. (laughs) Don't just set up your camera and start talking or take a photo. You need to look at everything around you as if you're looking at it for the first time to understand what could be distracting for other people. And this matters in physical locations too. Consider where the eye goes when people walk into your store and where you have different pieces of information laid out where products are. We have been conditioned to look up 
when we walk into buildings due to the cathedral effect. So what do they see if they look up? Can you draw their attention upward to signage with a very clear message? Be very intentional about where you want people to look, what the process is, and the next steps. Whether in an advertisement or a physical space, it's the same concept. Have intention, strategy, strong visuals, less text, and one next step that everything is pointing to, sometimes literally. And to help you with this and to remember it all, go check out that worksheet at thebrainybusiness.com slash 24. And if you would like help with this, you're not alone. This is exactly what I work with my clients on in our virtual strategy sessions. We work through website layouts, direct mail, online promotions, and social media profiles, everything from a single Facebook ad to launching a new product with a complete advertising package with billboards, TV commercials, and radio spots. And don't forget, this is the perfect time to up-level your brand with a series of strategy sessions in 2019 for up to 20% off. Instead of $4.99 for each strategy session, they are as low as $400 a piece if you know up front you want to do 12. And for six sessions, they're discounted 10% to $4.50 a piece, which is such a great deal. But you do have to commit before the end of this year, 2018. So if you're thinking about making an investment in your business by taking me up on this offer, send an email to melina at thebrainybusiness.com. I'm so excited to work with you in 2019 and help incorporate behavioral economics into your business, making it more brain friendly. Again, that email is melina at thebrainybusiness.com. All right, that's it. Episode 24 on sight and vision is complete. Next week on episode 25, side note, can we celebrate that milestone? How exciting. Okay, next week on episode 25, we are going to be moving on to talk about the sense of smell. And yes, more about why it's not about the cookie. Until then, Thanks again for listening and learning with me. And remember to be thoughtful. Thank you for listening to the Brainy Business Podcast. Melina offers virtual strategy sessions, workshops, and other services to help businesses be more brain friendly. For more free resources, visit thebrainybusiness.com.